Did that work okay? Am I like on the screen? Perfect. All right. Thank you. Can you hear? Is it working? Do I sound good? Yep, I'm Drew. I'm Stephanie. You're not I'm not. Okay. So let's see. The light says she's on. You can't hear her. Can you hear me now? Hello. All right, we're turning on and off. Sound okay? Can you hear me now? Talk. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Rich. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Through the microphone? Oh, no, it's just because I'm being loud. I don't hear you. All right. No good. No good. Okay. Want me to take you out? You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You better. Yeah, these are probably short. Sure. Sorry. Let me just see if there's any room. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Is that better? No, not yet. Yes. Can you hear? Okay. Yep. Sure. I'm saying words. Thank you very much for coming. Hopefully Hi, that's Anna, working too. well. Great. Anna, could you say something so that we can hear your voice and make sure it's working? Uh, sure thing. Um, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. We can hear. Sounds you. good to me. Thank you. Okay, great. Do you want Anna to keep going? Are we good? No, I think we're good. All right, great. Yep.
Hey, Tom, how are you? I see. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Drew the Dragon Slayer Thomas, coming to you live, both online and in person from the Norman Rockwell Museum. The mission of the museum is to illuminate the power of American illustration art to reflect and shape society and to advance the enduring qualities of kindness, respect, and social equity that's portrayed in Norman Rockwell's art. Before we begin, I'd like to read our land acknowledgement. It is with great gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we're learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land on which the museum was built. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, Today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we, commit, uh, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So now I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth edition of our Tuesday program, Meet the Artist series, where we'll be in conversation with some of the most talented illustrators and painters of our generation, as well as you all, the audiences, both online and in person, who we invite to be a part of the conversation as well. Today, we're thrilled to be talking with Anna Dittman. Anna will speak about her life, starting with her early work and inspirations. Then she'll talk about her creative process and show us a video demonstration. After that, she'll talk about her personal art. And finally, she'll talk about work she's done for clients such as Pas de Troy, uh, excuse me, Pas de Troy, uh, Rivers of London, and Stranger Things. We're grouping questions by theme, so we invite you to ask relevant questions as she shares about each topic. And at the end, <coughs> we'll open the floor for additional questions. So now I'd like to introduce Stephanie Habush Plunkett, the Deputy Director and Chief Creator of the NRM Museum. Thank you, Drew. And hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, both our in-person audience and our online audience, we're really happy to have you with us. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce you to Anna Dittman, uh, whose art is featured in our current exhibition, which is called Land of Enchantment, a history of fantasy illustration. How many of you got to see that today? Good. What did you think? Did you like it? Did anybody have a, a painting that uh, jumped out at you? Anybody want to say? It's like a red dragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. Yes. How about over here? Anything? You liked it all. Okay, that's great. Well, we're happy to have you. So my pleasure to introduce you to Anna Dittman. A rising young star in the field of fantasy illustration, Anna is a digital illustrator from San Francisco with a passion for figurative art. She now lives and freelances in, anybody want to guess? No. Amazingly, she is in Scotland, beautiful Scotland. <laughs> and that's the amazing thing about freelancing these days because with the digital age, you can be anywhere. But Anna has a love for nature and portraiture, which are recurring themes in her work. And she often draws inspiration from movement, organic shapes and natural elements, as you will see uh, as she shows her slides. Inspired by her father at a young age, she studied art 
online before obtaining a BFA in illustration from Savannah College of Art and Design. Anna works as a digital illustrator and designer, though she is adept with oils, watercolor, and charcoal as she is with a computer. Her work is featured on book covers, comic books, magazines, advertisements, posters, tattoos, and she has exhibited in galleries worldwide. She's also created work for a very wide range of clients, including Scholastic, HarperCollins, DC Comics, Titan Comics, VH1, Viacom, Imagine FX Magazine, Skyhorse Publishing, Cirque du Soleil, and many others. Um, we are fortunate to have Anna's I, dream I Dreamt I Could Fly in our current exhibition, which is an absolutely beautiful piece. And um, our curator of the exhibition, Jesse Kowalski, couldn't be here this evening, but I just want to mention that he noted that although Anna is the youngest artist in the Enchanted exhibition, her ability, imagination, and eye for composition compelled him to include her work among some of the greatest fantasy artists of the last 500 years. So we welcome you, Anna, and I guess we'll look forward to having you share your slides. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful introduction, and I'm so honored to be here today. Um, thanks to everybody who organized this, so Drew, Stephanie, and Rich, and Mary, and um, the Norman Rockwell Museum for having me as part of the uh, summer exhibition and part of the Meet the Artist series. Um, and thanks to everybody tuning in, both uh, in Massachusetts and online. Um, I'm glad the weather is <laughs> looking a lot nicer. I heard there was a lot of storms recently in Stockbridge, <laughs> so I'm glad that it's looking very sunny today. Um, it's, been, it's been a bit of a dark, rainy day today in, in Edinburgh, but um, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are um, we are happy. The weather has lifted. We've got we have had tons of rain here and uh, storms, as you say. I'm glad things are well there. Anna, yeah. as you are as you're launching your slideshow, I'm wondering if you might um, tell us a little bit about why you decided to move to Scotland. Such an interesting move because your training was in the U.S. and I, I think you grew up here as well. So, love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's a good question, and one I don't really know how to answer. Um, I knew that I I kind of wanted a change. Um, I think after studying in Savannah for four years, I, I definitely had enough sunshine for a lifetime, so I thought, oh, <laughs> natural <laughs> progression. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've always loved the country. My, my grandmother, she's um, from Scotland, she was born here. So uh, there was always picture books in her house and I would look through them and I was really inspired by the scenery that I saw. So um, I thought it was just a nice place. I visited once as a tourist and I just fell in love with the place. And yeah, I'm really like um, weirdly decisive about major life choices. So like, <laughs> Freelance illustration is one of those things and moving to Scotland is one of those things. But when it comes to like picking a meal off a dinner menu or something, I like go, go <laughs> paralyzed. <laughs> but yeah, moving to Scotland, I, I guess I never really questioned it that much. Um, and I love living here. I've lived here for um, six years now. So yeah. That's great. Seems like it's worked out well. Yeah, for sure. So are you, are you good with your slides to share? Um, yeah, I'll just uh, share my screen now. Sounds good. And um, let me know if it works out okay. Yeah, looks great. Oops. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, like you said, I'm I'm Anna. I grew up in in San Francisco, and um, I I moved to Georgia, then I moved to Scotland, and I've been freelancing for the past six years or so, um, full time. So I know a lot of artists who've been on this Meet the Artist series have um, 
been in the industry for decades now. Um, and so I'm quite a newbie in the field, um, but I, I appreciate being involved in this, in this talk. <laughs> um, Happy to have you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a digital artist primarily, and I, I tend to focus on um, portraiture, and I love a sense of movement in my artwork. So I tend to create pieces with um, a lot of like underwater imagery or nature or um, plants, petals, anything that really speaks to me. So this is just a quick snapshot of some personal artwork as well as um, client artwork. Um, and my client artwork tends to be focused on fiction nowadays. It tends to be um, young adult fiction or fantasy or sci-fi genres. Um, I'll do the occasional like personal piece as well for people who, who just want um, a gift or a tattoo or something, concept art as well, album cover art. So it's a mixed bag. Um, but yeah, I guess just rewinding a little bit back into my earlier work days. <laughs> this is really embarrassing. I wasn't sure if I should put this in or not, but um, <laughs> here's some early artwork. Um, on the far left, you can see some stuff that I made. I'm not sure what age I was here, but I found these in my parents' attic. <laughs> like the top pieces there were done in conjunction with these really weird, bizarre short stories. So I think I fancied myself more of a, a storyteller and um, I kind of wanted to be an author, I think at that age, more than an illustrator. Um, but luckily I, I, I became an illustrator rather than an author based on what I read. <laughs> um, and yeah, they would be more secondary to the stories I would tell. Um, these illustrations, or well, doodles really. Uh, and then the the bottom one here to to the to the left is a Bart Simpson doodle that I don't remember making, but I thought it was funny because I must have had a crush on Bart Simpson at some point. I decorated it with hearts. <laughs> um, I guess. I it yeah. looks like you have always, um, you've had a love of fantasy from your youth. Uh, is that the case? And were you often drawing kind of fantastical subjects? Um, definitely, for sure. I think all the short stories that I was writing was basically, they were weird, like, fantasy stories. Um, and I definitely, as a teenager, was really involved in, like, fantasy genre so I, I read a lot of like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, like a lot of other um, stories. And uh, that definitely inspired my artwork. I think because I was so involved in, in fantasy sci-fi as a teenager, um, that carried over into my style in my teenage years. And that's why I continue to do that to this day. So I still tend to do a lot of young adult fiction, even though I read less of it these days. Um, because I read a lot when I was forming my style. I think that's why I still continue to do that. Um, yeah. If so, I may, Anna, um, yeah. there's a rele uh, relevant question. Speaking of your crush on Bart Simpson, someone from the <laughs> audience asked, do you utilize models when creating your portraits? Um, yeah, I... <laughs> Wait, I'm not sure how that relates to the Bart Simpson. But... I'm, I'm doing my best here. <laughs> oh, that was a model, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. But I, we, can, we can get like deeper into this now or later if you want. So whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely get deeper into it. I actually have a little slide on how I use references, um, but I definitely do use references and um, I can speak more to, about that later on. Um, I, I don't know how I referenced this Bart Simpson doodle, um, but <laughs> I think it's probably from memory. Um, but nowadays I, I, I will use like a combination of stuff I find online, inspirations I find online, or I'll take pictures of myself in weird poses, which I also have plenty of embarrassing images 
for you guys um <laughs> and of like family and friends as well so um yeah I could talk about that a little later too um yeah that was good <laughs> yeah so I guess after after these like early doodles I I mean, I delved into a lot of different mediums as a kid. My parents were really great about providing different supplies. Um, so I, I painted with watercolors and acrylics and pastels. And um, yeah, they were they were super supportive of my work. So shout out to my parents if they're watching. I think they might be. Um, <laughs> and um, they kind of like also got like family friends involved. So um when I was like maybe a little older than 10 so from this image you can see from 2006 uh which is kind of like a pencil portrait um I I did a lot of these kinds of portraits for family friends um just for some pocket change as well because sometimes they would give it out to people as gifts and I guess my aim at that point was trying to get as photorealistic as possible because I thought that was like the pinnacle of art and I wanted it to be photorealistic and that, and that was like my ultimate goal. Um, later that that did change, um, but I guess that helped me like uh, get a good sense of um, um, anatomy and, and portraits and facial features. Not that this is this portrait is in any way realistic. It's of my little sister Paula. So sorry for including that Paula. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but at the same time around like, I guess uh, 2006, I also sort of discovered um, digital art. And uh, I have this old piece lovingly titled uh, Elf. <laughs> um, and I did paint an MS paint with a mouse uh, prior to this, but I don't have any of those um, pieces, thank, thank goodness. Um, but this was my first piece that was done in Photoshop Elements. And I used like this tiny little tablet that I think some family friends gave me. And um, yeah, I mean, it's very different to what I do now, but I guess it still retains like the, the portrait and the fantasy elements. Um, so hopefully I didn't peak in, in 2005. <laughs> um, but then later on, I kind of combined both of those two worlds. So I combined like the, the pencil drawings as well as the, the digital art. Um, because I think once I started with digital art, I, I just fell in love and um, it was wonderful to be able to use as many canvases and colors and to be as experimental as I wanted um, because I didn't have to worry about wasting supplies. So um, I could just churn out a bunch of art if I wanted. Uh, so I, I started to do a lot of um, line art and then I would scan those into the computer and then paint them in Photoshop. And uh, a lot of that tended to be fan art. Um, so I'm sure people could guess who this character is <laughs> down here from 2007. Um, and this is kind of when I discovered the world of deviant art and I got um, a deviant art account. And then I sort of fell into social media for the first time. And I think social media definitely encouraged me to keep creating artwork because suddenly I was getting all this positive feedback from people, not because the art was good, but because like I was creating characters from popular fiction. So I think people sort of found me through like tags and whatnot. Um, so because, because of that, I just had this positive reinforcement loop and I just, kept on creating artwork um, and I would be like painting and uploading stuff almost once a week, which I, I couldn't do now. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I kind of shifted a little bit from, from like the fan art kind of um, cartoon style after I realized that 
I didn't really want to do animation. I think at one time I also wanted to do animation, but then I realized that I was not patient enough to, to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I went back to sort of the fantasy portrait style artwork and I started creating a lot of like soft airbrush work that was inspired by like classical art as well as fantasy painters that I was really inspired by at the time. Um, so it was quite airbrushed and like the anatomy is a little iffy, but that kind of, I think was the, the starting point of, of my style now. So I, I definitely um, created a lot of like these sort of um, illustrations in, in my teenage years. And people often ask me about like improvement tips and I wouldn't necessarily recommend uh, being like an antisocial hermit in your formative teenage years, <laughs> <laughs> but it worked for me. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess I would recommend just creating as much artwork as you can um, and just uh, experimenting with style and not worrying about if something's working or not. Um, so a lot of that was just like, quantity over quality. And Anna, I read that you, some of your advice to young artists is basically just to draw every day. Is that something that you think is important to keep, keep your hand and your mind going? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that goes back to just like being, um, being on it as much as you can. And I think as long as you are, really invested in improving, then you will improve. I think that talent is often um, just a drive to, to be better. Um, so as long as you, you want to improve, you'll put in the time and then you will. So I think, yeah, when people talk about talent, I think people just talk about like the, the drive to want to, yeah, get, get some improvement done. Um, I, yeah. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I wonder, where was your early inspiration coming from? Do you have, did you have artists that you looked to? Did you go to museums? Did you, what were you looking at that gave you, aside from Bart Simpson, um, <laughs> kind of inspiration that was, that was helpful? Um, aside from my number one influence, Bart Simpson, I do have a, <laughs> I do have the next slide full of influences that would uh, definitely help answer that question. So, um, yeah, I think um, these are these are definitely all inspirations that helped with finding my style. Um, and um, there's it's a bit of a combination of a few different things. So I just have a folder labeled inspirations, and I just kind of threw stuff into the slide um, without any rhyme or reason. But I would say that in my early days, I was influenced by like the, the classical artwork. So the pre-Raphaelites like Waterhouse or the salon painters like Bouguereau. Um, I'm not sure if you can see like my pointer, but those are those artists. Yep. Um, yeah, you could, okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, um, and then I think like a lot of people who do similar um, style and genre as me, I was really inspired by Art Nouveau. So I would say Mucha was like a, a huge inspiration, still is. Um, and Gustav Klimt was a big inspiration as well. Uh, Egon Schiele. I just, I really love their combination of like realism with decorative ornamental elements and the use of pattern with like a realistic figure really spoke to me. I still definitely incorporate that into my work to this day. Um, uh, Felix Moss was like a, a is a Spanish painter who I, I really liked, um, as well as some more classical inspirations like um, Lion Decker and Norman Rockwell, of course. Uh, I like their use of um, realism, but sort of a stylistic realism, and their use of negative space as well. I think actually with Rockwell stuff, one of my favorite aspects is looking at how he used reference because there's such a wealth of, of 
information about his, his photographs and how he staged his photographs and um, how he like manipulated those to, to see his style. And it's, it's just very fascinating. And I would recommend looking at those. Um, Thank you for mentioning that. We actually have an enormous archive at the Norman Rockwell Museum of, um, yeah, there she is, Rosie, um, of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, um, of artworks and um, photographs so that really give insight into Rockwell's creative process. So I'm glad that was an inspiration to you. Oh, for sure, definitely. I'd love to see the museum too. Um, I've never been to Massachusetts before, but it would be great to see. Um, We'd love to have you visit. Hopefully one of these days. Um, yeah, so there's been a lot of like contemporary illustrators as well. Uh, so a lot of um, contemporary illustrators that I do admire are more traditional focused, um, not so much digital, but some of them would be Sam Weber, Eric Fortune, um, Agnes Cecile, who's, who's a watercolor artist. And I just, I just admire watercolor artists so much because I never mastered the technique, but I love like the spontaneity and just like um, I, I, everything about watercolor I love. Um, so I do try and incorporate a lot of watercolor texture into my own artwork, but I do tend to really, really like manipulate it in in a way that. Um, uh, is it maybe less spontaneous <laughs> than actual watercolor. Um, and then some more contemporary illustrators are uh, Tron Nguyen, who um, I look up to in, in Lois. She was very famous on the internet. She's actually a digital artist, but she uses a lot of uh, traditional uh, techniques and mediums as well to shape her artwork. So I guess style is really just a combination of everything that you you like in other people's artwork. Um, so there was definitely phases where I would go through where I would paint something that, I wouldn't say I would paint exactly like the artist, but I would kind of like steal their style and paint something that was like very Mucha-esque or Kunt-esque or like um, Wojcze-esque. And um, through that, I kind of discovered what I liked about their art and also what I liked painting myself and also what I didn't like painting, um, which was also very informative because like, for example, with Mucha, I was like, I, I don't really like painting all this like very intricate detail in the like background, um, like all the, the like mosaics and whatnot. Um, so I didn't incorporate that into my style. So um, I think it's very useful to, to look at people that you admire and, and see see what works in your art and what doesn't. Anna, I think that's really, what you just said is very important for everybody, for especially young artists to understand. And because the, as I've told you before, your art is, is some of the most recognizable art that I've, that I've ever seen. And the, the style that you have is so strong to think that you've got that way from taking what you've <laughs> learned from other popular artists that inspire you and turn it into something of your own. I think that's very powerful. And I, and so I, I just wanted to reiterate that. Yeah, I get. I mean, I guess that's what artists have been doing like for centuries, <laughs> just kind of picking apart what they like from other people, <laughs> using that in their own work. Um, but yeah, thank you. That's, that's to hear. <laughs> um, yeah. Anna, was was that a view of your studio and and your process? It'd be fun to hear. Uh, or so interesting to hear a little bit about how you think about um, creating your images, where composition ideas come from, concepts, and how you carry them out. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is kind of, well, it's an older picture of my old workspace. I've just recently moved, so everything looks a little bit different right now, and I've gotten a few new things. But um, Mostly I set up my space as having a monitor here, a laptop here. I use Photoshop and like this prehistoric Intuit 3 tablet that I love and will forever use. It's I think over a decade old, this model, um, but I've tried newer ones and I'm just such a creature of habit. So I'll continue using it until I can no longer find it on eBay. <laughs> um, 
but uh, that's kind of how I, I set up my workspace normally. And um, this process here, it kind of shows, so the way I, I create artwork depends on if it's like a personal piece or if it's a client piece. And I will typically be a lot more spontaneous if it's a personal piece and I'll kind of just go with the flow, crop things differently, um, kind of change things up completely. Um, if it's a client piece, I'll definitely be a bit more um, methodical about it and structured. So right here, this was actually, this was a personal piece, but I think I knew I was recording the process for it. So I didn't change things up too, too much. So I tend to start off in, in black and white and I'll just make a very sketchy version of what I want. Um, and then I'll continuously add detail, slowly add um, texture and color, and then I'll play around with color throughout the process. Um, until it's more finalized. But yeah, I do typically just tend to start out in black and white and like very sketchy. And then here I've created a bunch of textures and I'll use those throughout my process. So um, I have like a pretty big texture library that I have either scanned in um, textures that I've made myself or I've bought them online or they've been free online. And I'll use those throughout the painting process. Um, so here you can see me adding on something on a different layer mode. Although I think recently I've kind of changed the way I use textures a little bit. So I use less like splatter effects and more just canvas effects. Um, but I think that's just because my, my style is evolving a little bit, changing a little bit. Um, but it's, I definitely use textures that, like throughout my process always. Um, so. so the paintings that we're seeing on the right hand side were, um, are basically hand painted experiments, Anna? Um, do you mean? Uh, uh, on the lower, your lower right frame, the blue um, splatters and. Yeah, these ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not. Like, <laughs> I'm not confident enough to create watercolor full on illustrations, but I do sometimes create just like splatter effects with, with watercolor and we'll just like throw those into Photoshop to, to manipulate them further. Um, but yeah, these are some stuff that, that I made um, a while ago. I think they're available online too. I think um, they're in some tutorial of some sort if you Google my name, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Anna, if I may, I don't want to take us off process so we can get right back to it, but we've had this question. Uh, somebody asked, how did you discover your passion for digital art? Um, I think it was more almost an accident um, or I, I can, I'm not really sure, but I know that somebody gave me a tablet I think it was a family friend and I think I somehow got Photoshop on this really ancient like computer of mine and I started to just doodle a lot more. I think a lot of the um, artists I was following on the internet at the time were doing digital art so I was like oh what's what's this all about because <laughs> it was a relatively recent medium at the time um, so I think my curiosity kind of made me search more into like how to actually create stuff. And once I got a hold of Photoshop, um, I just like something awakened in me and I was like, I don't think I'm ever turning back to traditional medium um, just because I found it so convenient. I love control Z and going backwards and yeah. Um, Anna, was, was digital illustration uh, an important part of your studies at Savannah College of Art and Design, or had that not quite made its way into the program? Um, so I did take a lot of foundation courses, which were mixed. There was a lot of uh, traditional techniques involved, and a lot of the foundation courses were like one traditional technique um, per quarter. So it was like, you will learn watercolor this, this, in this class. 
um, or you will learn like oils or something. Um, so I, I think going to college actually helped me learn more um, traditional techniques because I at that point I was more into the world of, of digital medium. Um, but I, they were, I think at a certain point after you moved past from your foundation levels, at least for me, like a few years ago, um, then I started, the, it was kind of a more open-ended. So um, all the illustration courses were like, we use whatever medium you, you prefer. Um, and I'm sure that's the way it is now. Like if you, if you go, if you pass the foundation courses and enter into the, the actual degree, I think it's pretty open-ended on, on what medium you prefer. While we're talking about art school, uh, somebody from the audience did want to ask, how did art school prepare you for life as an artist beyond the skills that you expected to learn? Um, I look back fondly on my art school days. Um, I think the main thing about art school was meeting people who were like-minded. And I met so many wonderful like friends and teachers who um, just constantly encouraged me and challenged me. Um, and I had never really had that before, before going to SCAD. Um, I would say that's my biggest takeaway from our school was just like the people um, that I was surrounded by. And I think that's like definitely a huge reason why it's worthwhile to go to. Um, yeah, uh, definitely there was a lot of professors. There's one in particular who I would ask questions to after I graduated as well, like in terms of how to price things and how to create contracts and stuff. And that was a really useful skill to have as well. Um, so, yeah, it was a good time, but like I do know that nowadays there's there's so many resources out there that um, allow you to grow. And I would say the main thing about like progressing is basically putting in the time and effort yourself. So if you're willing to put in the hours, you I think that's the most important part. Um, whether you go to art school or, or not. Um, if you if you are determined to like spend the time to improve. Yeah. Anna, how did your clients first begin to discover you? Because that's a really difficult aspect for many artists to think about how to make those connections and get seen. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how that happened for you because you've worked with so many interesting and diverse clients. Yeah, I would say, like, sometimes I actually don't really know how people find me, and it's probably a question I should be asking people <laughs> when they reach out, um, but I would say, I guess the biggest thing nowadays is just social media, really, um, so having an online presence is the main thing. Um, I know that changes with time, like, my advice like five years ago would be very different from my advice now, but I would say like nowadays, maybe Instagram is the platform to be very active on. Um, uh, I know I've used definitely a wide variety of social media sites over the years, but um, it, it does change, but then your, your followers do kind of follow you um, throughout different platforms as well if you're, if you're pretty active. I mean, one thing that I'm not that good about <coughs> is, is just like updating constantly, um, whether that be new art or just updates or old art or progress shots. I know that I don't do that often enough probably, but um, I think like the rule of thumb is to update maybe once a week or something if you have like a media site. Um, and in that way, you just get your name and voice out there and, um, and then uh, other people start to see you, whether that be like just fans or clients. Um, so yeah, just being very active on social media. And I say that I'm, I'm not currently do, doing that as much, but, <laughs> but that's a good, um, I guess, um, thing to keep in mind if you're just starting out, just constantly churning out artwork and putting it online. Yep. Great I know advice. you, Thank you. Um, just because of what you said, I know whenever I'm uh, illustrating a female character and I'm looking for inspiration, I see your artwork all over Pinterest. So I don't know if you know that it's like 
all over Pinterest and the internet and stuff, but that might be one way that people will find you. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, maybe that's true. I didn't even think about that really. I mean, I see some, sometimes my stuff on Pinterest too, because I use that as a resource quite often, but I think the internet just shows me that because um, of cookies or whatever, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I guess that's everything about the process here. And then I have some references too to show next. So this is probably really embarrassing as well. Um, but <laughs> to, the, to the right here, I, I just think it's very funny because it, so this was for a comic book cover for DC called Captain Adam. And it, I'm not particularly proud of it. I, I wouldn't say that like very muscular men are my forte, but um, they did ask me to read this cover and it was kind of like a very quick turnaround. So I, I took a bunch of references and selfies of myself um, in my room and I turned myself into like a, red buff superhero man and <laughs> um i i guess that's the the magic of, of photoshop and um illustration so i think a lot of illustrators do this as well um they just use themselves and it doesn't really matter if you look like the reference or anything but just as long as you can like tweak certain things about the reference and make it your own um so uh, yeah, I have a bunch of embarrassing pictures of myself that yeah that <laughs> I pose for, and I've definitely asked a lot of friends and family to to model for me. Um, and so shout out to everybody who's been my model in in recent years. Um, but I would say that this to the to the left here is more typical in how I use references, at least for like personal artwork. So I'll just save a bunch of like Pinterest or internet pages. And I'll, once I'm starting a, a piece, I'll just throw them on very like haphazardly. Um, there's really no rhyme or reason to, to how I put them on like this blank canvas. And then I'll just reference them throughout the painting process. So I'll just look at them here and there until they're no longer useful. So um, yeah, I've got a bunch of different like um, stuff for plants, faces, expressions, flowers, like fashion, just all kinds of things saved um, that could be useful at some point. So that's kind of how I, how I use references throughout my work. Um, yeah. So I also have a, a digital video process that I was going to show. Um, it was a, an illustration that took maybe over 20 hours, but it's condensed here into 20, into, to, into four minutes. So I, I won't subject you to, to, to. <laughs> um, so let me just switch over to, um, the video process. So just as a quick introduction, um, this is how I use, this is typically my, my process. Um, I'm not using Photoshop here, but I'm using a very similar uh, program called Affinity. And um, it's, they actually commissioned me to do this piece, which is why I, I have it recorded. Um, and yeah, they're like, I guess Adobe's competitor, they're like kind of um, a bit more economical. It's like a flat rate fee for like, I'm not sure how much, but um, yeah, it's, it's not a subscription based program. But um, yeah, this is the finalized piece that they commissioned me to do. And then if anybody has any questions throughout it, I'll just talk throughout it as well. So, um, uh, here I am just painting the sketch and I am starting off in black and white as I normally do and it's pretty loose. Although I did kind of know the composition I wanted from the onset because um, it, it was a commission. <laughs> um, so here I am adding some touches of color using layer modes. 
Um, so I use a lot of soft light layer modes and color layer modes to add, add uh, some subtle color effects. Um, and I use digital art almost as if it was traditional. So I won't use a lot of brushes. I have my brush library sort of here, but I pretty much only use like my soft brush here and then like a chalky brush. Um, and those are the main ones that I use. And then I only use one layer primarily. Um, those other layers here are just texture layers that I don't merge down. But I'll continuously add a layer, then paint over it, and then merge it down to my background layer. Um, so it's basically almost as if it was um, traditional. I think that's because probably back in the day, my computer can handle a lot of like layers or effects or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that kind of stuck. So here I am adding some, some textures, like manipulating them, um, merging them down with time. Um, yeah. I'll constantly like flip the canvas horizontally, especially if it's a more symmetrical portrait, because then you can kind of catch out certain like details that you you didn't see uh, that works well for traditional art too if you put your uh, images up to a mirror then you can kind of see like the things that you wouldn't normally notice so here i am just adding a bit more detail to the leaves and background um i'm using like a streaky brush here to add effects to the hair um, I don't normally zoom in until much later in the process because um, I like to nail down a composition and have like the, the basic um, idea ready because sometimes if you get too involved in like anatomy or something and then it doesn't work out then you have to start from scratch. So yeah just adding a little bit more detail. Sometimes I'll go in and like blur certain areas just to give it a bit more of an atmospheric quality. Anna, was this created for publication or was it for a personal commission that someone um, reached out to you for? So this was created specifically for um, to advertise for this new program called Affinity. So um, they would use it in like their social media and stuff to say like, oh, this artist created this in this program. Right, um, thank you. Yeah. So they gave me a lot of creative freedom. They just sent me a few images of some stuff that I'd created beforehand. And then they were like, we want something similar to this. So it was a, it was a really wonderful project. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the, the final product right here. Um, so, I mean, it is, it is a program that's different than Photoshop, but it's basically how I create everything in Photoshop as well, because there is like a, a lot of similarities and overlap between the two programs. I have a question from our audience. Oh. What was the question? Just give me one second. I'll bring the microphone oh, over to you. you. Yes. All right. I was just curious how long it was from start to finish. How long? Um, I think this one was maybe 25 hours, I would say, maybe. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but um, I sent them all the files and then they condensed it. So um, from what I remember sending, I think it was like maybe 25 hours. Yeah, good question. I would say that, so with personal artwork, um, it does take a lot less time. So I could, I could probably create something in maybe three days if I spent a lot of time doing it. Um, whereas with client artwork, because there's a lot of back and forth with the client and changes and everything. Um, normally with client artwork, I spend around two weeks to a month 
working on. Um, but then again, there's a lot of like back and forth um, email chains and um, yeah. Speech. Is it challenging to work as part of a team in a way? I mean, of course, it's your art and your vision, but as you mentioned, uh, with illustration, there's often a lot of back and forth and um, requests for changes and things like that. How is that for you? Um, yeah, I mean, most of my conversations are normally just over email. Um, so it's definitely different than I would say maybe a typical job where you do work in person with a team. Um, I mean, I, I do really enjoy working with clients. I love getting feedback from them um, and the collaboration involved. Um, but it's definitely more of a one-on-one -on -one thing. Even if it's an art director in a company, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one thing. So it's not, it's normally not like a team of people that you're, you're talking to. Um, even like most of my conversations just are over email and not necessarily over Zoom or are in person or anything. Um, so, yeah. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And uh, kind of on this topic, somebody from the audience asked, what does a typical workday for an artist look like? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm not the best person to answer that, but um my typical work day normally starts like quite late um <laughs> I would say I, I tend to work like late into the night so I I don't really wake up at like a, a normal human time I would say um I've been trying to change that in recent times um but I tend to wake up do a bit of administration answer emails then dive into the project I'm working on and honestly like I will work until um, the end of the day if I could so um, normally uh, if, if I'm meeting people or friends outside that'll be my break but if, if I'm not I'll, I'll just keep on working and that's actually something I've tried to change during like this this past year because there's been a lot less you know social time <laughs> so I've been trying to give myself more breaks um throughout the day which has been really helpful because uh you do get like burned out with time if you're just looking at the computer all the time um it does it doesn't help with like productivity at all um so yeah that's just a recent change I've had to make with, with my work, work set, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so after this one, um, I'll just uh, go back to the slideshow. So, um, I, I've kind of just combined a bunch of personal artwork here. Um, can everybody see that? Okay, I'm not sure if that's switched. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I've just organized it. So I've showed my personal <laughs> art client artwork later. Um, but here's just some stuff I pulled from my portfolio. Uh, it's kind of a combination of older artwork and newer artwork. So I would say- anyway, I'm sorry, um, just because we just had a last minute question on the process video that you showed us. Somebody asked, um, they said they love the backgrounds that you dropped in. Were they a layer that you screened back? Um, on, in the video that- I think they're referring to the, when you brought in the color, did they, did you like change it to a screen layer or did you screen them? Um, so what I would do with the background would basically, there were, there's not too much like digital effects involved. So I would basically just paint everything on one layer in black and white. So the background as well included in that. Um, and I guess in terms of the screening, um, I do use layer modes for, for color and whatnot. So um, when I have my black and white sketch, which in, includes both the background and the portrait, 
um, I'll create a new layer and then I'll set it on a different layer mode. And um, sometimes that'll be like um, a soft layer or uh, overlay or something. And then I'll start to add uh, color into it um, to give it some vibrancy. Um, but normally I don't separate the background from the character um, unless it's like very special circumstances if that's what the client would want or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, that's that's typically how I would um, combine like the background and the character. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Were there were there ever any times where you regretted not separating the character from the background and had to like redo work, or are you just a pro at it and it's never mattered? Um, I mean, there's been times where a client has asked me for the Photoshop file, and then they've come back to me and have been like well, why isn't there more layers? Yeah. And I explain like, oh, well, I don't really use layers. <laughs> um, but in terms of like regret for not including backgrounds, um, I don't think so. Cause well, I guess there are advantages to that. For me, it would be easy enough to just like get rid of the background and like isolate the face or character and just create a new background. Um, I mean, that's not ideal. Like if that happened, it wouldn't be like great, but <laughs> it would work out okay in the end, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely advantages to having layers. Um, I, I just find it personally more advantageous to use one layer at a time. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> so yeah, here's just some samples of a uh, personal artwork. Um, I would say like these ones here are more recent and these ones are a bit older. So recently I've kind of shifted from more um, saturated uh, color pops to maybe more like muted pastel colors. And I've also recently enjoyed experimenting more with poses and fuller figures and fashion as well. Um, I think just for a change of pace really. Um, but even with my old versus new work, I still combine some of my favorite things. So like water and plants and flowers, feathers, tentacles, wind, petals, all, all the good things. Um, so here's some more personal artwork. Again, these here are more recent. These are a bit older. So I think with my older art, I definitely enjoy using more um, negative space, white space for the background versus like a more detailed face and figure. Um, and then these ones are playing around with more poses and um, yeah, more um, fashion as well. Um, and then I've separated the client artwork too, in a way too, because I, I have saved more of a, a process for a lot of client art just because of the nature of client art. Um, so these two are covers I did for HarperCollins for a book called The Sea Witch and then its sequel. Um, so they had a pretty clear idea of what they wanted for this book. And um, I, I've attached some sketches that I did for the sequel here. I would say that for um, client work, I tend to send maybe one to three sketches. I think I got a bit carried away here because um, I just really like the, the theme of the book and also they weren't too different in their composition so it wasn't like too drastic of, of changes for each sketch. Uh, so they went with, oops, they went with um, the second one and then that went pretty smoothly from there. They didn't have too many, too many extra changes they wanted to make but I think we had established a bit of a rapport from the first one too so it's it's kind of nice to come back and, and see what you work with. Cool. 
and then here are two like self-published novels from authors so this one was called the siren's last song and then this one is a french publisher who i won't try and say the name because i don't know french um <laughs> but they were both reference covers and um with those you kind of have to be mindful of how the text um, will play with the illustration so sometimes i'll do the graphic design for a cover sometimes i won't um most most of the time i won't but if it's requested, I'll do it. So for this one I did, and then you just have to kind of keep in mind where like the decorative elements will fall into place. So I think, so clients will normally send me like a pretty detailed brief. Well, I mean, it depends on if they have something specific in mind or if they're pretty open-ended about it, but we'll normally talk, chat a little bit about um, the, the details involved, the characters, the imagery, and then they will um, agree to something I've suggested and then I'll send the sketch. So with this one, I kind of um, told them the sketch in detail and then sent it to them. And they were pretty happy with that, I think. So there weren't any big changes here. Um, so this, this sketch is pretty detailed, I would say, but it depends on the client sometimes. Sometimes it's better to just show a loose sketch. Sometimes it's better to show a detailed sketch. It just depends, really. Um, yeah. Anna, while we're talking about these, uh, someone from the online audience asked, how did you break into book cover illustration? Um, I think I think probably because I was really into books as a teenager so a lot of the artwork that I was creating was like similar to the book covers I was seeing in, in stores and because this was the artwork I was showing online maybe it resonated with other authors and maybe they they saw that and were like oh okay I can see this illustration on my book cover and um so that's why they hired me um yeah, I'm not sure exactly why people hire me, but um, uh, I think maybe there's a correlation there because it's just something I'm already passionate about. Um, and it's something that if they see something in my portfolio that they could also see kind of visualize on their book cover, then maybe that's why they would reach out. Um, yeah, I, I didn't intend on going into freelance illustration with the mindset of, I'm going to be a book cover artist. Um, but I think it just lends itself well if you do portraits and figures. That will lend itself better to um, book covers than any other genre. So that's probably why that happened. Thank you. Yeah, so um, this this cover here on the left called Welcome to the Island Over the Edge. Um, it's actually like a D&D &D anthology book. So it was kind of unusual because I read through the book and then I took notes on what might be relevant details to show on the cover. So normally I wouldn't read through a book unless it was specifically requested by the author. Um, but on occasion I will. So with this one I did, and because it was such like a wide variety of different scenarios and worlds, um, the sketches are all very different here. And then I picked the first one and then I kind of went with that. I think I experimented a, li a little bit with like splatter effects and they weren't really happy about that. So then I, I went back to the original sketch and um, that's the cover that I ended up with. So I think my notes were like a monkey face, um, a noose, cityscape, airplane crash, piano keys. So a bunch of different little random things that you probably don't pick up on when you first look at it. Um, and then the these um, covers here on the right are both comic covers. And the one in the middle was for a variant cover for a comic called Die, also a D&D cover. So I've been doing a lot of D&D &D stuff for whatever reason in, the, in recent times. 
Um, and then the cover to the far right was for Rivers of London, and it was a comic for Tit Titan Comics. And then here's just a few more um, client works. So the ones to the right here, the one on top, is for a French publisher, and it was a reselling of Beauty and the Beast. Um, the one below that is for Fireside Magazine, which publishes science fiction uh, short stories, and it was a spot illustration for one of the short stories. Um, and then the one on the left is the one that's featured in the museum right now. Um, it's called I Dreamt I Could Fly or Just Fly. And it was actually created and commissioned by a, a musician. So he wanted an album cover and he saw my artwork and I guess it resonated with him. So he reached out and said, hey, I think your artwork matches my, my music. Um, and then he sent me a few tracks, which are very like electronic, uh, atmospheric um, um, music. And I, I listened to it and I, was, I, I did resonate with it and I thought it was a good idea. So he was very open-ended about the brief. Um, all he wanted was, since his album was called I Dreamt I Could Fly and there was a lot of themes of flight, he wanted perhaps some feathers or some wings. Um, so, um, I sent him a few sketches and then we went with this one and yeah, I think it worked out okay. And it was a very unusual commission in that I, so I always have something going on in the background when I'm working or painting. Um, but normally it's not at all connected to the actual painting itself. And with this one, it was because I was listening to the tracks. And that was kind of inspiring the, the illustration. So um, it was definitely a unique commission and um, a really fun one to create. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that all worked well together to create, to create a piece that we were both happy with. Yeah, we're thrilled to have that piece on view. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you, yeah. It was a lot of fun to make, and I wish I could see it in the museum, but yeah. it's too bad. One, th one thing I'll just ask, um, and you know, your slide here uh, illuminates that you, you do focus quite a bit on the female face, and I'm wondering if there is something about the ex expressive nature or what it is that actually appeals to you in terms of the portraiture that becomes uh, really such an important part of your illustration art? Yeah, I do tend to focus on um, the female figure more often. Um, I think mainly it's because most of my inspirations that I looked at um, and I was inspired by a, as a youngster were a lot of women and female figures. So I think I pulled like a lot of that influence from those artists. Um, I guess, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to say because, um, I mean, it's almost like saying like, why do I, I like painting nature? Um, and why do I like painting women? But I think I tend to like painting more, um, um, like feminine, I suppose, um, imagery. I mean, even when I do paint men, they do tend to be a little bit more feminine. <laughs> um, so I, I, I can't really speak to that, why that is exactly, but um, yeah, it definitely is a theme in my work. And I mean, I've been trying more recently to paint um, more like male studies as well. Um, and definitely in my work, I, I, I do more, more guys, I guess. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, it, I don't know. I guess it just lends itself well to the other type of imagery that I enjoy, like nature and, and movement. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, so this is the last slide. So it's just a more recent project. And um, I did this last year and it was commissioned by Dark Horse Comics. And um, 
they basically wanted variant covers for their comic Stranger Things and Dungeons and Dragons. So this comic was with the characters from uh, the Netflix show Stranger Things, um, but it was more about the adventures that their D&D characters take. Uh, so it was a lot of fun because I was already a fan of the show Stranger Things. And um, yeah, getting asked to do this was like such a joy, especially because it was last year. So it was really good distraction. <laughs> um, so I initially started with Will the Wise and I sent these sketches um, and they picked the one on the far right. So they wanted each um, composition to kind of echo each other. So um, after this initial sketch, it was pretty easy to, to start the other ones because there's a sort of framework already in place. Um, and yeah, this one was so much fun because I got to watch Stranger Things at the same time while I was painting. And um, yeah, I guess, like I was saying before, it's kind of unusual to, to um, have something on in the background that relates to your work. So that was a real joy. I, it was a bit of a challenge too, because I don't often paint characters that um, exist in the world. Like people will send me images of models or references uh, or actors or something and they'll be like, I, I want this character to look like this person, but it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a true likeness. So this one was kind of interesting in that I had to really capture a, um, a likeness and that's not something I've done in a very long time, maybe even to back to my early like teenage works. Um, so it was a lot of it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, good project. I really love this. Just as a fan of Stranger Things, I think <laughs> your, their facial expressions and the colors you use match their personalities perfectly. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I tried to figure out the colors um, in conjunction with their personalities. So I'm glad you picked that up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then I wasn't too familiar with like the whole d, &D angle in Stranger Things either. So it was a lot of fun to kind of create like the characters. They did give me reference material for each of the characters involved, but um, uh, there was some creative elements to designing like the outfits and whatnot. So um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a good time. And the art director was so lovely. Um, so uh, it was a great project. <laughs> Beautifully done. Yep. Yeah. And Anna, what are you working on now? Do you have some projects on your digital drawing board? Um, yeah, so right now is actually quite an unusual time. I took maybe a month and a half off because I'm currently, I'm, I've just moved. So I'm renovating a flat. So I was just spent a month and a half just stripping wallpaper and sanding floors and um, plastering and painting. And so it's very different from the, the digital illustration world I'm used to. Um, and it's probably also the longest break I've ever taken from illustration. Um, so I, I kind of was a little nervous about like re-entering work I did a few weeks ago and yeah, when I opened Photoshop, I was like, oh, no, like, what if I've forgotten how to do this? But, <laughs> <laughs> but when I opened Photoshop, I, I, and I started painting, I just got like that rush of endorphins. And um, yeah, it just reminded me that it's something that I love so much. And it's also so much better than stripping wallpaper. Never strip wallpaper, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, but the project that I'm working on now is, it's for, a, um, I'm doing a cover for a client that I've worked with before. So it's sort of an anthology of um, stories inspired by the Grimm's fairy tales, but with a twist in that all the characters are queer or trans characters. So um, there'll be a series of those and I'm working on the first cover for that, which is really fun. Um, and then later in the month, I'm going to do some concept art for a game that 
um, um, I've worked on last month, but or two months ago. Um, so yeah, yeah, kind of a difference, but yeah, it's good to be back at work again. So. <laughs> Well, we are absolutely thrilled to exhibit your art here at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, for everybody who isn't aware, the show will be on view through October 31st, and it will then travel to the Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and to the Flint Museum in Michigan. So uh, we'll go on from here, which is always exciting. And we thank you so much for being a part of this program series. Uh, your comments were so interesting. Uh, just both from the creative point of view, the technical point of view, and just to learn more about you personally. So we thank you so much, Anna, uh, and wish you all the best in all the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for all the very thoughtful questions. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I was a little nervous about um, doing this, but it's been a really good time. Oh, you did such a great job, and we're yeah. very thankful. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great evening. Before we wrap up, I just want to say also, Anna, thank you so much. I could happily talk with you for hours, honestly. I've had such a great time talking with you. I also want to thank everyone for coming and being a part of the growing community of artists who understand the profound effect that this illustration work has on the way we think of things. We've had around uh, 600 viewers tonight across all of our platforms gathered here tonight. So I want to thank you all for making this such a great conversation. If you want to check out uh, more of Anna Dittman's art, feel free to check out her website at AnnaDittman.com. Uh, and next week, feel free to join us for, we'll be talking with Bob Eggleton on August 10th at 5.30 p.m. And after that, Julie Bell on August 17th at 5.30 as well. Um, we'll have an outdoor art workshop with Ruth Sanderson called The Magic of Trees, Plain Air, on Saturday, August 7th, from 1 to 4 p.m. And then we'll have our third annual Art of Brewing Festival with drinks, food, and fun on, on Saturday, August 21st, from 1 to 4 p.m. And Raiders of the Lost Ark 40th Anniversary Screening will be on Wednesday, August 25th, from 6.30 to 10.30 p.m. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. We can look into that and 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 get you the information. <laughs> be happy to. That be that be me. Okay, you're going to be the designated driver. Well, we'd love to have you guys come. Well, listen, I mean, they send us emails all the time. I tried to send back a question, but I didn't hear anything. Okay, we'll get your information, you. and I'll get you that that background. Good question. Thanks. And as Stephanie said, uh, the history, Enchanted, a history of fantasy illustration will be on view through October 31st. And Land of Enchantment will also be on view through October 31st. And thank you all for joining us. Please uh, become a member on nrm.org NRM if you want to support this work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming, everyone. Happy to have you.